Hello, and welcome to The Bard's Truth, with yours truly, The Green Bard, also known as Alive Alive O on the forums. Although I place no limits on what I'll cover in the future, this podcast and YouTube channel focuses on magic in A Song of Ice and Fire, the book series written by author George R. R. Martin, which is the basis for the popular Game of Thrones series on HBO. This is your fair warning that I may spoil any of those media. This is episode 0.1, King's Blood, Magic, Elitism, and 10,000 Years of Sex in Westeros. So I was reading a tweet from Davos Fingers and Joe Magician today, and it sparked these thoughts. Now I'm sharing them with you on this podcast, YouTube, my blog, and Reddit. Also, credit where credit is due, some of this is obviously based upon LML's Great Empire of the Dawn ideas, which I kind of take for granted is mostly true at this point. He has a related YouTube video out on the subject, and I highly recommend it. So, even as I subscribe to the idea that King's Blood of the Science of the Great Empire of the Dawn may be a requirement for magic in A Song of Ice and Fire, the man of the people in me tells me that this concept is very elitist. Which brings me to the other side of the thought. I think that this king's blood has been spread far and wide over the 10,000 years since the Long Night. So we may find in the next two books, A Dream of Spring and The Winds of Winter, hopefully upcoming soon, that a lot of the characters we know and love are capable of magic in the supernatural. As the magic ramps up, more and more people will begin to exhibit what Varamir calls the gift. Early in the story, only certain people show it, but that's mainly because their experiences as elites makes it far more likely for them to develop magical power in this world. One example is that Bran develops telepathy from his coma and his subsequent sensory deprivation in the crypts of Winterfell, trauma in the north, and finally more sensory deprivation in the cave. Masked in the story is the elitism. He is fortunate to have the people devoted to him. Servants sworn to protect and defend him. Odor, Mira, Jojen, and others before that. Without that supporting cast, he could not shine nearly so brightly. I'd say that some of his supporting cast may end up being magical too, even as others are sacrificed, as we know likely will happen with Hodor and with what people seem to think already has happened with Jojen. Mira was critical to the survival of all of them, and I hope she gets a moment to shine later, especially given ideas and theories about her parentage that may end up being true in the end. Another example is in A Game of Thrones, where the fortunate up to that time Sansa can watch tourneys, and Arya can practice looking with her eyes with Sirio and chasing cats to develop her gifts, while Gendry has to concentrate on his hammer, and Hot Pie has to concentrate on his pies. People like them just don't have the opportunities the elites have. Job one for them is simply to survive. While Gentry is implied to have King's Blood, I do wonder if Hot Pie might end up being exceptional before the end too. Even if not, we already know that he's an exceptional baker, so that may be enough to make my point here. Gentry being a bastard actually proves my point in another way. All these bastards feed the genetic pool of common folk to such an extent that it is impossible these genes aren't almost ubiquitous in um, Westeros and beyond at this point in the story. Sure, the Starks, Danes, Hightowers, Blackwoods, Lannisters, and Targaryens may have retained the magical blood through careful breeding pack practices and marriage practices, but at the same time, they shared it far and wide in the blood of their bastards and vassals. You also see the elitism at the Wall with Jon and the recruits and the senior officers and all their behaviors. However, as George R. R. Martin points out, through John's lessons from terrific characters like Donald Noy, Maester Aemon, Corrin Halfhand, Egret, and Mance Raider, the wildlings and, and all the common folk are men, and all the men of the Night's Watch are men and women, um, not, so mu not so different than any other man or woman. I'd bet the magic is in the blood of the likes of Cotter Pike, Harwin, Angai the Archer, Darien the Bard, Missande, Ricaro, Wex, Big Bucket, Aliaya, Yandri, Pretty Pia, Old Nan, and yes, a Moon Boy, for all I know. And that's the Bard's truth. I am also a big fan of Butter Bumps, so maybe him too.
postscript. When I think of my inclusion of Wex in that list, I think of other mutes. It occurs to me that anti-magic Varus may have unwittingly fostered the gift to be expressed in his mutes. As seen with Bran, traumatic experiences can trigger powers, so I'd say these little birds likely have it, if it's in their genes. And then there's Sir Illin. I should stop there. <laughs> so, my friend Rachel C. Cow pointed out to me that Brandon may have left some little snows around before he died, and that's just in the recent past. Certainly that's true, and um, I'd say that Brandon is just the tip of the iceberg, as they'd say. Imagine how many more people there are like him, and Roose Bolton, and Corlys of and the Sea Snake, who, via the Lord's Right to the First Night, left bastards all around Westeros for the last 10,000 years. And that's just for Valyrians and First Men on the Westerosi side of it. The same would be true of other cultures that can be traced back to the Great Empire of the Dawn on the Essosi side of the Narrow Sea. I see many cultures where this is highly likely. I'd certainly include all in the Far East, the Dothraki, the Sarnori, Giscari, Lazarine, Nathi, Summer Islanders, Valyrians, Roinar as well, maybe even the Andals. So basically everybody, except the hairy men of Ib, and I'm probably wrong about them. So a little more on how I got to these views and my idea of magic in general in this book series. I think that you need two things to trigger the expression of magical power. One, special genetics, and two, personal experience. I don't think the genes really drive how the magic is expressed, the possible exception being the heat resistance of Valyrian dragon lords. To me, magic is magic. Whether it is expressed as skin changing, green dreams, prophetic visions, visual arts, illusion, oral arts, hypnosis, fire magic, ice magic, blood magic, telekinesis, temporal manipulation, etc. To me, how magic is expressed is likely affected by the experience that one has. For instance, um, if one is a knight, one might express their magical ability in skin changing your horse or in incredible speed with your sword through some kind of telekinesis. If one is a Stark who obtains a direwolf at a young age, it might be expressed through skin changing, or later illusion through being forced to hide one's identity as a Stark or skin changer a la Arya Stark. Looking at it another way, Melisandre seems to have the power for vision slash prophecy, glamour, shadow binding, fire magic, and blood magic. I don't think that she got those powers specifically because her genes say she gets those powers specifically. She got them because she has innate magical ability and was being taught these skills or developed them spontaneously due to need. So in the case of Bran and other Weirwood users, they use the Weirwoods because their personal experience led them to the Weirwoods. Now on the difference between having green dreams or being a skin changer, and having the ability to become a green seer, I can only go with the text and assume that the ability to be a full green seer is genetic. From A Dance with Dragons, Brand 3. Only one man in a thousand is born a skin changer, Lord Brynden said one day after Bran had learned to fly. And only one skin changer in a thousand can be a green seer. Genetics are a condition of your birth, so it is definitely genetic. To me, the likely extrapolation of the text is that there is a gene for skin changing and probably all other magical ability, as I explained previously. I'll use Preston Jacobs' theory here for one idea for how that might translate to human genetics. If you have it on one of your chromosomes, you can be a skin changer in this case, or a garden variety magical user in a broader sense. And if you have it on two chromosomes, then maybe you can be a green seer or an uber talented magic user in the general case. By and large, my essay is talking about the garden variety skin changer and magic user, not the green seer or uber powerful mage. As an aside, I think there are five or six people alive in our story now who we have enough information that I consider them possibly to be the uber variety of a mage or the green seer side of things. Bran and Bloodraven, obviously, possibly Arya, Danny, Euron, and Melisandre as well. There may be others, perhaps in a shy or maybe some wood witches like. Maggie and the Ghost of Highheart, but those six are the ones we know a lot of detail about from the text. So, in closing of this discussion, sure, magical ability is probably hereditary in A Song of Ice and Fire, but 10,000 years after the first long night, a lot of common people have this ability, and I look for them to develop it soon. What do you all think? Let me know in the comments, and give a like and subscribe to my channel. 
I also have a Patreon page, and I'd love to have some more subscribers there as well. Thanks a lot. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Barb's Truth. Thanks as always to the wonderful artists who shared their work with you and me here. 